Well, thank you very much for that nice introduction, and it's a pleasure to be here this afternoon at the Hudson Institute. Um, I want to take you back, and I think this book sort of tries to take you back to a time um, very much like our own today, um, when the U.S. is in a global battle against an implacable foe, and the, Mus the uh, prospects for success are seen as bleak unless we can somehow win the hearts and minds of the Muslim world. We've tried reaching out, but have failed. And our president, a man of faith, a churchgoer, isn't a Muslim, but has an affinity for Islam. He wants to reach out and is now willing to make allies with a group of Muslim thinkers that his administration knows to be undemocratic and maybe even fascist, but whom he's willing to court to bring victory in the ideological struggle. And so I'm not referring to Barack Obama or George W. Bush, but Dwight D. Eisenhower and 1950s America, when a lot of this book uh, takes place. I guess the bulk of it in the 50s and, and uh, 60s. I think this is a period that's often overlooked in our discussion of Islam and our dealing with radical Islam. Uh, many of you are familiar with what happened in Afghanistan in the 1980s, arming the Mujahideen, and there was a bit of blowback, of course, when some of the Mujahideen uh, morphed later into Al-Qaeda. Um, this era is 20 to 30 years earlier. It isn't as direct a link to today in terms of uh, links to terrorism, but the discussions, the public policy discussions, are very similar. Um, for, and, and the key one being how or, or whether we should engage with groups that are antithetical to our ideals. Um, I focus on this one mosque for a few reasons. One is its fascinating history, uh, which I think in its own right uh, warrants some sort of, of, of closer look. Um, its history dates back to the years before World War II. Um, and goes through the Cold War and up until the present day. And the other reason that I was interested is, is, is again, for these public policy issues. Um, and that is how we deal with these groups, how we try to instrumentalize religion and, and, and the pros and cons of that. Um, as Halel mentioned, this all started when I was well, I was based in Germany, and I was living there after 9-11, and I, uh, we were looking, of course, at the immediate s terrorism aspect, but there was obviously a much deeper story to be looked at. For example, why three of the four 9-11 uh, pilots were, had been radicalized in Germany, what had been going on there. And I'd heard a little bit about the Islamic Center of Munich, but its importance was really driven home to me when I click, and yeah, nothing happens. Uh, technical? <laughs> Maybe I have no. to like pull that one? No. Uh, well, anyways, so when I was um, looking at this, ma at this map of the world uh, in a London bookstore, and the map of the world Anyways, like, the map of the world colored countries according to their percentage of, of, of Muslim population. And that's a fairly standard map that I've seen in many parts of the world. But what really um, got me was around the, the rim, uh, around the edge of this, of this map, were famous mosques of the world. And there's the map. There's the countries of the world colored according to their population. And there are the famous mosques of the world. Um, and I thought, it was almost like the Sesame Street, one of these does not belong. And I thought, what is the Islamic Center of Munich doing on this, in this pantheon of world mosques? Um, it's certainly not the most important mosque in Germany, let alone Europe. Um, but as I looked into it more closely, I realized that in the history of political Islam, the Islamic Center of Munich does indeed play a key role. Um, for example, the former head of the Muslim Brotherhood in, uh, in Egypt, uh, Mahdi Akaf, I visited a few years ago, um, 
coincidentally also had a map like that on his wall. Uh, but he was the head of the Islamic Center of Munich for several years in the 1980s when he was in exile. Um, and the story really begins uh, for me in the, in the 1930s with this man, Gerhard von Mende. Gerhard von Mende was a brilliant linguist um, and as he was called in Germany then a Turkologist. I don't think that's an academic discipline in the United States today yet, but with academic specialization, I'm sure it will soon appear. Um, he studied the Turkic peoples primarily in the Soviet Union. And he wrote a book that was very astute that came out in 1933 that predicted that the Soviet Union one day would break up along ethnic lines and that the countries that would be created would probably be unviable on their own. Um, von Mende probably would have had a, a bright academic career, except that the Nazis were coming to power and he allied himself with them. In 1940, he was called to serve in this building, which is the, today the head of the German Society for Foreign Policy, the DGAP, um, in Berlin. It was the former Ostministerium, the Ministry for the Occupied Eastern Territories which was to be the sort of colonial administration for the conquered parts of the Soviet Union that the Germans wanted to uh, take control of. Um, and von Mende was put in charge of the non-Russian people. He was to coordinate policy toward them. Uh, what happened in the first few months of the German invasion of, of the Soviet Union the, was that the, the Germans took millions of, of Red Army prisoners, about three million by the end of 1941, and put them in these appalling camps, uh, POW camps, um, uh, where many, many died of typhus, etc. The Germans and, and von Mende quickly realized that uh, a lot of these soldiers did not want to fight for the Soviet Union and could be used as allies. So this was a picture of one person in my book in his Red Army uniform, uh, they were culled out of these camps, the people that wanted to, to join, and fought for the Germans. Um, this was a patch for one of the units that was set up under the uh, SS. And they, they fought, not with great distinction, they were not frontline troops, they were mainly used for guarding supply lines and fighting partisans. And after the war, most of them were ended up in displaced person camps. Von Mende realized that they probably shouldn't end up in Soviet POW camps or else they'd immediately be eliminated. So he had the, the units transferred to the Western Front. They ended up, uh, a lot of them, in southern Germany in DP camps where most of them, I'd say 99% of them, were repatriated under the Alta Agreement, sent back to the Soviet Union to face their, uh, their fate. Uh, and a number of them, however, by hook or by crook, managed to stay on in Germany after the war. About, um, I would say about a thousand stayed on. And some of them were helped by the Turkish Student Union, which went down from Berlin to the camps and handed out student IDs to many of the, of the uh, soldiers, because a lot of them were from ca modern day Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, spoke a Turkic dialect and could, if they ditched their uniforms and their papers, uh, claim plausibly to be Turkish. So they stayed on in Germany after the war, about a thousand to fifteen hundred of them, lived in places like this, DP camps, they were pretty um, pretty rotten accommodations. This is a propaganda poster, a uh, propaganda photo that was taken at that time showing what a great new camp they'd set up, but most of them were not that great. Um, von Mende resurfaced again after the war as head of a, his academic career was now, he was even for post-war West Germany, he was fairly discredited, and set up a freelance intelligent, intelligence organization called the Research Service Eastern Europe, which was funded by a variety of West German agencies. And he reconnected with these people down in Munich and tried to make use of them as emigres for West German uh, propaganda purposes, um, to try to send them out to countries around the, the Middle East to try to counter West Germany's uh, main enemy, which is East Germany, and also to make a case that 
the German border on the oder uh rivers should be only temporary and that Germany should regain its lost territories, which are now occupied by Poland. 